Creo que ya empezó. Um, so this is my presentation. It's going to be about this paper. It's called Under Robbing and a new mechanism that actively promotes selfing in plants. So for me to explain to you what is going on in this paper and in this process, I first have to tell you some basic concepts that, that appear in the introduction, but I'm going just to state them so that it's faster. So first, in, uh, and very important, it's called inbreeding depression. The inbreeding depression is uh, when a plant inhibits its own seeds germination to encourage plant survival to maturity and fertility. Um, there's also another concept that's called plant cross fertilization. Um, it's the process that is that inhibits uh, inbreeding depression. So cross fertilization is when you have one sub one plant and it fertilizes another individual plant. So it, it, hermaphrodites are not but well do not do this process. Mm, what else? Uh, so yeah, cross fertilization is like very common, especially in flowering plants, and well, in all kinds of plants, but especially in flowering plants. And it is promoted by various traits such as oh, shit. I don't uh, such as uh, visual and well, sen sensible traits like visual colors like in well very colorful flowers also big petals and uh, what else ah yeah um other uh, traits that are anatomical like separation of anthers and stigma physical separation in the same plant for example if you have an hermaphrodite um or well they, they have they would have very separately their two organs so that it would be Low, well, not likely that they will um, fertilize one another. Mm, this is called hercogamy. That's what I said, that the special separation of funders and stigmas. And another method is dichogamy, which is the separation of gametes and uh, maturation times. For example, well, when sperms are mature, the stigma and the ovules are not mature, so it's impossible for them to fertilize one another. Um, so across the history, evolution has favored cross-fertilization. Um, as I said before, hermaphrodites tend to have mechanisms that avoid selfing. That well, I'm going to be saying selfing when I say self-fertilization just for short. However, during states of uh, evolutionary stress, like well, bottlenecks, or when there's a lot of co competence, selfing is favored instead of cross-fertilization. Cross um, that is something curious, and it's something this paper tries to address, but doesn't do it, like, very much. <laughs> mm, what else? Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, and some of the traits that are related to to selfing plants is that they are not very attractive for pollination. And one of these plants is the one where the queen, we're going to talk about in this paper that is called Aerysium incanum. So this plant displays these characteristics. It has, uh, well, it has very small flowers, that are yellow, but they are also kind of greenish as I, we're going to see in the following um, figure. They are also, they doesn't. They don't produce a lot of nectar. Very ah, very little nectar. That's what they produce. So it's not very attractive for pollinators. So it, this is what the authors think that caused the plant to evolve this system of selfing that is very particular and that hasn't been found in any other plants. Mm, it's also an animal monocarpic. And. Uh, for this experiment, they used three populations. All of them are from African region. However, one is Iberian, so it's nearer to Southeast Spain. And the other ones are from Morocco, Morocco. One in the, one in the, one in Central Morocco and one in North Morocco. 
um, they calculated the ergogamy values that remember ergogamy was the separ the physical separation of anthers and stigmas to avoid uh, uh, self fertilization and they and they found that they were well obviously better little um, and then 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 used several processes to for this experiment. Uh, they use time lapse time lapse videos and photographic documentation, which is to record the movement of the plants, or well, of the anthers. Uh, so here they specify what kind of cameras they used, but it's not like very super important for the for the paper. So yeah, uh, it's important to know that they used uh, micro macro photographs to in in very short intervals to record sort of movements. And they also and they also that the um, the, the plants were lighted by LED illumination, white LED illumination. Um, also, they compare this. Well, they use the same method in other plants, such as well um, the one we're going to use in our project, which I just forget. Ah, here it is, Ardos Italiana. And. Oh. And they well yeah that's kind of it so for the for the methods so yeah now the most important part is the breeding experiments and fitness assessment that they did um, so they did several experiments in these plants in only in our target uh, species that is Aerium incanum first. Well, you, you need to know what emasculation is. Emasculation is the removal of stamens and thus the removal of anthem, uh, anthers. So first, they, they did uh, five overall experiments in these plants. First, they, they did emasculation before stamen movement. This is prior to flower opening, meaning that they would not have fertilization by under rubbing. And then they used uh, emasculation after stamen movement which is right when the, the rubbing stops, they remove the stamens to see, to be able to test reproductive capital and maturity of the pollen. If it, meaning that they wanted to know if the pollen was mature right after rubbing or it, it need to go undergo another process to go to get the full maturation. Then uh, they also, they do another experiment that is autonomous selfing that if they were just control flowers, they did nothing to them. They were just there, and they did use four cell thing. They did use and uh, they removed anthers from one plant and used those anthers to pollinate another plant. Um, this was to test maximum reproductive output. I know, sorry, that first cell thing is they remove the anthers and they then pollinate them without using the natural method. They just took it and. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. so I don't know where it stopped recording. Okay. So, yeah, forced selfing was the removal of anthers to hand pollinate, which means that they took the 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 anther of one of one flower, and then they well, yeah, of the same flower, and then they just took it out, and then it did it themselves. They the robbing. And that was just to test maximum reproductive output, so they ensure that they used all the polling that was in the anther. And the last experiment was outcrossing. So first, they uh, removed uh, the anthers from one plant and used them to pollinate another plant. So that was that's pretty much it. Um, for each procedure, they calculated the fruit setting, which is the fruit sprouting, fertilization rate. That is ovules of, over fruits, fertility. That is number of seeds over fertilized ovules, ovules, and seed production, which is number of seeds over ovules. It doesn't matter if they fertilized or not. Um, so now we go to the results. So here, ah, let me just. Uh, 
like that. And if it can be, yeah. So here in this figure, um, this is figure number one. We can see in in, in A that the, uh, the the petals are like yellowish, but more like green. They are very small flowers, and they have very low production of nectar. Um, we can see that the anthers are facing inward towards the stigma that is in the center of the flower. I, it cannot be very seen very well, but it's like where my cursor is right there. Um, yeah. So in that is in figure A and B. That's what we can see there. Uh, the pollen was visible in the anthers, which is figure C. This is an anther, and these little dots, like there, there, that's, that's the pollen, the pollen grains. And in in B, we can see this is now an, a stigma. Well, it's the same picture, but now the pollen is in the stigma, which is uh, there by the white arrow. That's the stigma, and then the pollen grains are right there. So that's after rubbing. Now, in this photograph that we see here, we can see, well, these this black arrows like simulate the movement of the, of the, of the uh, anthers. Um, it's, it, that is like a repeated swirling, rubbing against the stigma and sometimes they recorded that they rub one another. This is not not why it happens, but the, that it just happens. So, yeah, that's what. And in this uh, little, uh, I don't know, uh, figure that they draw here, it represents the same movement. So the center line, this one, is the stigma, and these things that look like beans are the anthers, and they move circularly to rub against the stigma. And sometimes, as you can see, they can be low or high and they sometimes rub on one another. So that's a phenomenon that they observe, but they don't know what it means. So now we go to the experiments they did for uh, inbreeding. Uh, so you can see that for emasculation before uh, maturity or before rubbing, nothing, there was no, results in any of them, neither or fertility or fruit set and fertilization or seed set, which makes sense. But it also tells us that these plants have no way of reproducing by uh, outcrossing naturally. So these plants cannot um, reproduce if it's not with themselves. I don't know if I'm explaining it. If I'm, well, yeah, that's what it means. In all the others, which is, this one is emasculation after maturity. This is, um, what? Autonomous selfing, which is the normal, well, the natural way. The forced selfing and the outcrossing, which is, well, also forced outcrossing because it doesn't happen naturally. There's not much variation amongst them in either of them, um, which is kind of interesting because, um, well, we'll see that in discussion. <laughs> so yeah, uh, they had no different, they had no different results. And also they did not produce, produce inbreeding depression, which should happen. Um, so now we go to discussion. Well, this is, well, you can see also that the variance is not very high. So, all the testing that they did across 20 plants and, they, and their offspring was very good, so yeah. So in the discussion, they touched various points that they defined in, in, the, in the text. First of all, um, under growing in this species seems to be enough to reach maximum, cap maximum reproductive capacity. Um, They also observed, right, I, I also, I previously said that they did these experiments, well, only the photographic ones in other species, especially in Ataliana. And they said that something resembling this movement happens when the flower closes, because the closing of flower is, well, prior to it, 
there's a little movement that the hunters move towards the statement like this. Um, also, um, they made a lot of emphasis in autogamous reproduction, that is the well, selfing, but it happens in two ways. Is the prior selfing, which is the, the one that this plant does, that the plant of the paper does, because it doesn't depend on outcrossing levels. It, it just does it always. And there's also the, uh, what's it called? I don't know. Uh, ah, delayed selfing. The delayed selfing thing is, it happens when an outcrossing plant has something that avoid that keeps it from outcrossing. For example, the lack of pollinators, like there's no bees or something like that, it starts um, activating pathways that make the plant start being a sulfur, so it can survive. Um, <laughs> And it also it's due because the plants should have no alleles that promote inbreeding depression. Because as I said, inbreeding depression is the that one that promotes that the plant is lives by itself instead of reproducing. I don't know if I'm saying it. Um, so yeah, um, during this well, this the, uh, all these experiments of of fertility and that were done when just a uh, stage of the life cycle is called uh, uh, seed setting. However, and even though these results were not conclusive, that they, they, they told us that inbreeding depression is like non-existent in these plants. Mm, the authors recommend that these experiments of inbreeding depression should do in other life cycles because in other plants, inbreeding depression seems to be a factor after post in post dispersal, I mean, after the seeds go away from plant. Um, what else? Uh, so they also mention a lot of uh, plant movements. Uh, they, uh, well, in most plants, they are normally provoked by external stimuli. For example, in some flowers that they move towards the sun, or insectivorous plants that they move when something comes in their well, mouth. I don't know. Um, other plants just move when they are touched. Um, and yeah, however, this one. All of them depend on exterior stimuli, and this anterobing is completely autonomous, so it's kind of very weird. I mean, none other plant has been found to f have this kind of movement. And well, yeah, this paper is pretty short. <laughs> now, only the only thing missing is the conclusions. So, uh, coding the paper is anterobing is effective method for promoting self-fertilization through active and repetitive movement of stamens. Um, there, there are likely more species to be found to have this kind of mechanism where they rub like this. However, they have been there. No one of them have been found to have them. Uh, still, during this investigation that they made, they found that strangely, nature promotes selfing, which should be not promoted when there's a lot of plants near, nearby you or however, because it would tend to not have uh, how this in English. Mm. Mm. Intercombination of genomes because you will always be uh, reproducing with your own genome. However, nature seems to be not scared of this, and plants keep well more and more plants keep turning to selfing instead of just staying without crossing. So yeah, they, they think that in the future, another plant should be found that is have a similar mechanism to this one. And that's pretty much it. Ta-da. Ahora se escucha la música, ¿verdad? Ahí sí se escucha. Pero sí nos escuchamos, ¿no? Sí. Okay. Um, okay, maybe I have like a question, like what would be like an applicability of this, like maybe I don't know, like for having a better production or I don't know, do you think there's a, an application for this? So, well, in the paper it doesn't say anything, but maybe because in, if you just like, if you want to be to clone something, 
it could be a method alternative. I don't know how much better or how much worse it would be to propagation. But if you want to clone something by making it a little easier, like just ripping off the anthers and put it in another one, well, selfing plants that selfs would keep me from an invalidation at the minimum. However, I still think that there's a chance, like they said, that the, that replacing with its own genome sexually might tend to, it's called eugenesia in Spanish, where, yeah, the, when you, when there's a short genomic pool, well, then you start having mutations that are like horrifying. So, yeah, but I think that it, it might be useful. It, it, it will have to be tested if it doesn't cause that kind of, of phenomenon. If it doesn't, then it might be um, an easier technique for cloning or for just having plants that do not variate a, a lot amongst each other. Uh, I have a question also because I don't know if the article um, talks like about how the movement is promoted or if there are like chemical factors or transcriptions of something, I don't know. Or what the, no, they, they, or the possible causes, I don't know. They do not uh, tell us, they just talk about hypothetical pathways of, I mean, genetically, because they, they also say what might promote this, as, as I said, it would be lack of pollinators, uh, awful flowers, low nectar production that you would not attract any kind of pollination towards yourself. So that kind of factors promotes this selfing phenomenon. However, they do not talk about genetic pathways or specific genes that cause this or that favors this. They just say that they exist. So then no, they don't talk about that per se. Like, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Any other question? No. no? Okay, so that's that would be it for me. I'll be expecting your presentations. And yeah. Okay. Oh, sí, sí, sí. Bueno. Ahora sí ya está en la Sí. Okay. <laughs> Como tres veces, sí. Well, I'm going to give a presentation of this article that is a three-dimensional fiber scaffold as an investigative tool for studying the morphogenesis of isolated plant cells. It sounds like a kind of long, but actually is pretty simple, but actually really cool what they did. So in a nutshell, what they did is that they created a new method to cultivate in a 3D manner cells. So the benefits of doing this in a three-dimensional way is that it mimics more like a um, reality of what the cells experiment. And this was um, made by using biocompatible scaffolds. So these scaffolds, what they do is that they provide a developmental um, clues of a structural stability. And also this was made from taking colors derived so, uh, so grown cells and were taken into that. So, uh, just like a spoiler, this protocol was um, proved to be a rapid uh, way to cultivate cells compared to other kind of um, culture. And also, they found a lot of things that are useful for further more research. Like, for example, the cells have different morphologies when they are inside the scaffold. And also, it's really interesting that these cells may be, uh, I mean, these scaffolds and kind of uh, culture method can be escalated to other kind of uh, uh, plants. And also it's really important that they discovered that there's a scaffold cell interaction. So I'm going to explain it more in detail about this. And a little bit of background about these um, scaffolds is that in plants, uh, there wasn't before there wasn't really like a 3D um, culture. I mean, in tissues of mammals and other animals, yes, there was a previous research over like for 20 years, but not really in plants. So in plants, there was, there was only like 2D 
uh, methods and also like there was like a microfluidic channels that that could be like considered as a 3d method but it wasn't really like an environmental uh, structure so it doesn't really mimic the native uh, conditions and so with help like for the um, previous research of animal scaffolds and 3d culture they decided to test this in plants so just like, like a little bit of background of what is a scaffold a scaffold or maybe like an andamio is um is like one of these is like a temporary structure that helps to um like like to give support and to reach to parts that otherwise it would be like impossible to reach and it's like a basis for something so in this case the scaffold they use has to have different <laughs> has to have different <laughs> um, properties like it permits cell penetration and it has to be biocompatible also the fibers it has to be tissue specific and have certain mechanical properties so with this what the polymeric microfibers give they do give like these mechanical properties that they need but they do not have the um, like a biocompatibility or self penetration thing so in combination with nanofibers that do they have the mechanic the um, nano the i mean like for the cell to attach better and to have like better penetration they mix them and get like a good scaffold for this purpose so this is like an animal scaffold so what they do is they have the scaffold and like the base and that cells get that as a, like a guidance to develop different structures the, the extracellular matrix and so on so for building the scaffold uh, they took into account these properties that i mentioned before and what they did is like um, through air spinning like they had this and they started spinning and created these little nanotubes um, they created the scalpel they say that is like um, high yield production so it's uh, in theory not that costly and I mean here we can see like the um, microfibers and the nanofibers uh, just to take into consideration that the nanofibers are not like uh, cannot be visualized in the next uh, images that you will see because they are really small but uh, the cells are attached to them. So this is the scaffold that they made. Um, it was, uh, it, it, it is also biocompatible. That it was made with PET and PVA nanofibers. So also um, something that they did, if they, because it was not made before, they had to like prove that the nanofibers are really important for this. So in these images, they have like different um radius of nanofibers in each of these and for example the first one is uh zero percent um then it's ten percent and finally seven percent of like concentration of nanofibers and so it can be seen that there are not really cells attached to it so that it shows the importance of having nanofibers and here the cell that was used was the Arabidopsis thaliana. So it was like uh, stained, so it can be seen, so it was visible. And here in the little arrows that we see are the places where the um, cells attached to it. And um, also to prove like they were indeed attached to it and not just like stuck, they did like, for example, little silica uh, particles that have more or less the same size of a um, cell and they put it into the um, scaffold and give the same treatment that the cells of agitation and everything and the results were that almost all of the silica bits uh, fall out and the um, cells indeed get um, stayed in there so that was like the proof that the cells were indeed attached to it and well, yeah, here is all the process. If you want to see it later more in detail, uh, I can do it. Um, and here is also like they put into consideration that the pressure effects 
they were put into different pressures and in a vacuum. And also it was seen that it really has no effect because there's are no relevant effects because the cells are still attached in there. And also here is the morphology part that I told you. They put like uh, reporter genes in, acting, in the acting production. And here we can see like the different structures that the cells are making and the different interactions and how they form around the axis of the different um, five microfibers. So here you can see that they are spin or they are a large. They had different um, structures. And it was also like really interesting that they said that most of these structures were not seen like in vitro, like in a petri dish or something, nor in a plant. So they uh, found new morphologies in here. And here are more morphologies. And finally, here's the, plant, but the part when I told you about that it can be applied in other cell lines. This is another plant that is called Cinia, ele ah, Cinia elegans, <laughs> and um, it, they they also stain the plant, and they also see that uh, I, they also saw that it um, had different interactions with the nanofibers and the little arrows are the plant are the parts where the cell is attached to it. So there, these are like different uh, applications that may be useful in computer. Like for example, they can, um, maybe in some five, uh, animal 3D cultures, they have like different hormones um, that are like inside the scaffold and that are releasing like different hormones. So they say that it may be possible to do that with these plants. Although they said like they cannot try it and said that there are really no effects, but it, um, it, it may be like an application. So, well, here they say a little bit of the things they say um, about that. They are like, in some concentrations they stay, but in higher concentrations they die. So there's like an application of that, like testing different hormones in different ratios. And also like, mm -mm, well, that's about that. Uh, another uh, protein was affected, the G GFP, that with the hormone radi different hormone radius, um, it continued producing and the cells were leaving, but there was no G GPF production. So there might be like, an effect of how the, the hormones are released. Uh, they don't know about how the, it is diffused inside the scaffold, but they are just like putting the results. And um, in, in a nutshell again, like this is all, all the, they found about this, that they can develop an effective protocol for plant culture in scaffold and 3D. And they have like, they define the optimal necessities of the scaffold, like of the materials, of the concentration of nanofibers and so on, and how this scaffold can influence on the morphology, and that it's a potential to study physiological responses to fetal hormones. So in conclusion, they developed a simple system that permits the study and facilitates imaging of fluorescently labeled cells that interact with a 3D environment, and also like all the implications that this has and how the morphology changes and so on. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question because um, you talk about the morphology can change because mm -hmm. of the structures of the scalpel. So why this is important or why it could benefit like the culture? Um, it is interesting that they found that these morphologies are different from what are seen like in different types of culture and in, also in plants. So it's like um, maybe how they change or maybe the, what they do. I mean, for example, we have a different morphology of cells in epithelium and in heart cells and they like have different functions. So maybe their morphology can be linked to different functions and maybe they have acquired different characteristics while they are in, in a 3D scaffold. So maybe they are, um, they, in this way, they can be useful for another things or maybe they uh, do other uh, proteins. I don't know. So, but it was interesting that they actually never even saw this in, in plants. So it's 
like for a like for the example the morphology uh, per se is not useful but the change of it and what it represents i think that it's really interesting and can mean so other kind of things so then i don't think i don't know if the morphology for example if we want to create like a like a um, animal culture mm -hmm. uh, the morphology if you change like the morphology in some cells you can like affect the whole culture of the whole functionality. I don't know. I don't know if we have the relevance, the morphology with the function of the of the plant, of the organ, of, <laughs> of everything. I mean, like, should, it may be. I mean, maybe the way they are arranged it involves like another kind of functional tissue. But I mean. And comparing it, like for example, to um, 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 I don't know, my like mammalian uh, or animal culture tissue. For example, if you're interested, like in the kind of morphology they will have. For example, if you want like a scaffold for making uh, knee tissue, like it would be you will have to adapt to the different kind of cell morphology that you want. So your cells are all uniform and can perform the function of the need you want. So maybe like in that case, you will have to experiment in the, in the, the, the relation. <laughs> so I have, well, I don't know, it's like an observation. Um, so do you think, well, yeah, it's a question. So do you think that um, this change of morphology in plants could be able to help with problems like um, accommodating plants in soil so they can use better the nutrients distributed in this soil or like in reforestation that you can uh, force plants to grow with center pat in certain patterns that are favorable to the proliferation of plants and the, well, yeah, the growth of new uh, organisms in places that should not be able to carry them anymore or something like that? Mm, I mean, it could be if you link like for example this thing of the relationship of the morphology and their function so i think it might be useful but you also could have to like characterize that like if you want them to like produce more co2 or i think that there is like it would be more important knowing like the genes involved in that um in order to survive rather than the morphology, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean it because, well, there's plants that have special necessities for growth. So that may help to make some, some parts of soil more efficient. I mean, if you can make a plant to morphology, like use the space some other way or need less space to develop, then you can, then you should have a higher productivity and, well, yeah, that's what I meant, I don't know if I... Oh, okay, 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 like, to make plants in order to adapt in different spaces? <laughs> <laughs> it was a question. <laughs> no? <laughs> no, it's just a Like... What you mean is that you can make the plants to adapt in different spaces, no? <laughs> uh -huh. It was like an observation. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that might be. Maybe. Nice. Sounds nice. Yeah. Because we need, we have no space, but we need more plants, so yeah, that might, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So yeah, I don't have any more questions. News. Where is the flecha? Stop record. Well, I will um, talk about this article. It's flower enhanced vascularization and moderation of ki of kidney organoids in vitro. Uh, also, well. First, we have to know a little bit of knowledge about how the kidney works and like the important, the, why, uh, how it works. So it's, it's only, well, you need only know that it, it, um, 
helps to filter blood and that help us to maintain fluid homeostasis, like to remove all the wastes and the toxins that our blood have. have. And mm, this is the way mm, when you keep like the balance between all the fluid of your body. Also, it helps like to keep all the electrolytes, electrolytes in the levels, in the right levels. And as you can see, it needs to have like a very um, well-defined defined vascular network. Like the vessels are very important to filter all the blood and everything. So if you want to culture an organoid of a kidney, vascularization is the most important thing if you want to have a functional kidney. Um, I will, I think it's better to show you the video first. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but I don't know if you can see it, so if you don't see it, just say me. <laughs> sí, lo ven. Ah, ya está. Sí, bueno, ya se tengo que proyectar otra pantalla, ¿verdad? Yo creo que sí. Okay. Ah. Well, this is like a summary of, of the of the article. Mm -hmm. And like the it's like the results that they obtained, but I will talk about the questions that they want to answer. And they want to answer four principal questions. The first one is like how factors affect the culture of kidney. And um, they develop a uh, kidney tissue from pluripotent stem cells and they evaluate like all the factors like the extracellular matrix, the media, composition and the fluidity share stress. I will talk more about that. And also how does the continuous flowing because they create a millifluidic shift well uh, with a constant fluid like passing through the culture and in this way how this way of culture the the organoid helps to sustain the vascularization. Also, the question number two was if they they really obtain like a perfusible vessels because they need to filter and pass things through the vessels. So there, the, those vessels present these perfusible like activities. And the third question was like if the kidney organoids are mature or present morphogenesis 
or tubular epithelia, as we can see in the last class of culture in the class with Medium. It was like uh, the epithelial deformation of epithelia. They like they, they have uh, the shape well defined. If those those kid, kidney organoids have this formation, and the four is that the um, they really have the maturation of podocytes, and podocytes are like the most important cells in in the kidney because they have like the real function of the kidney. They filter some of the blood and have a very specified vascularization method. So they want to, to really prove the, the, the function of the organ. How did they do for answer the first question? It was, they create the millifluidic as you can see. Well, I, I try to have like a pointer, but I can't. <laughs> well, <it's laughs> so you can see the in the figure A, like the ship they built, they try to um, and like all the methods you can read more about it in the article because they say like what are the the factors they put in in the days like zero to four day they use a, a factor to increase some um, activities of the culture and they do it for 21 days they then they study the the extracellular matrix how, how what is the best way to have uh, the culture and they put uh, adherent and not adherent extracellular matrix they put um, for adherent gelatin Gelatin, gelatin, fibrin, perdón, sorry. <laughs> gelatin, fibrin, gel brand, gel brand. And for non adherent they use plastic, glass, and fibrin, and a lot of factors. So they don't show all the methods and how many times they do, but they show like the main results because they used to be like a lot of factors. And in B, they is to the uh, some factors that B is for to show the cells because it stained the the DNA. MCAM and BECAM one are factors of vascularization. MCAM is a precursor of BECAM, so it helps like to see the um, the creation of vessels. And um, but XXL is also a receptor for uh, podocyte cells which are like a more developed one. And as you can see, adherent extracellular matrix have more vessels and world form because the colors of the precursors are more intense. Also, they try to, in C to E figures, they show like all the progress between the days, day 12, 16, 16 and 21. And in F to H is like the photographs of, of, the, of the organoid, like to see how it is growing. Then also they try to um, culture them in like a lot of uh, ways. The U wall, which is the first image, is like in like the positos of a spectrophotometer. They try to culture in, in that. And you can see that they are not mm, making like a lot of vessels. Also, they try to do it in a static uh, culture, like without the fluid. And they see as like is this like the conventional one, like the like the see well the convention. <laughs> and then they do it with low flow and high flow to study the fluidic shear stress because because vessels in the in the kidney are con continuously being affected for a sheer stress because of blue, uh, blood passage. So they found that with a high flow, like with a, a, um, with a greater sheer stress, they uh, have a better vascularization of the, of the of the of the, of the, of the kidney. Sorry. <laughs> Um, then they try 
to use a technique. This is Angio Tools Imagine Technique, and there are like photographs in 3D to study like if really they have an increase in the vessels area or in the branch point, they have like more branch point that which means that they have more vessels proliferation and also like the length of, of the of the vessels. And they found, as you can see also, that for high flow, they have uh, a lot of more increase in vessels and a higher length. So it increased a lot of enhance the vascularization. They do a, a QPCR in the figure N to um, and like quantify the transcript for pecan factor, and also they show that high flow with a high flow they can have a more pecan transcripts. So also that helps to vascularization. To answer the question two, two they study the the factors that activity the vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. Also, they have like the in the figure B, they shows a flow cytometry study, and I really don't understand well how they reach to to uh, have these numbers, eleven point two percentage and four point twenty five, but with a high flow, we can have a more intensity of the KDR receptor which means that have like a lot of more vascularization than in other ways of culture these organoids. And to E to E is also a QPCR to measure endothelial cell markers, as I mentioned, but they are different. Uh, for example, they measure PDGFR beta, which is a transcript for protein and is essential for vascular development. So we also see that for a high flow, they have all these factors. Mm, in the next photograph, in F, and they also make that, uh, they attain the, the, the proteins of the membrane, and they show us in the figure F and G, how all the markers express in the same zones, like there are, Mm, expressing in the same places. So there is a vascularization in the same place. Then in the figure H, um, they change like the axis of the, of the photographs and to see like the lumens, uh, the lumens are like the, the ojitos where the blood will pass through. So as you can see in, in here, uh, there is like a black thing, and this thing is like the vessel. They are forming like the bolitas. And then to E to G, um, well, E to K is like uh, a, a photograph of the, with a microscopy of the tissue. There are, they show us how of the lumen is forming also, the bolitas. And in K is like the control because they, this is like in vivo a photograph of the kidney vascularization. So we can see like the same as the figures. And also they try to be how if they are really perceptible, like to have to, if they can promote the passage between the inter blood and external fluid. And in L, they try to stain pecan factor. And in M, they put like beads in the fluid that are uh, bolitas of <laughs> 100 nanometers diameter. So they found that the beans are in the same zone of pecan one because um, the, um, it gets blocked with the passage. So when the bean want to enter to the, to the little lumen, they can do it. So they be um, atrapadito. 
and they block the passage. So in the photograph, we can see that it, indeed the vessels are perfusible. And then in in photograph, they put like here one organoid and then one the other one, and they show that these organoids start making vascularization between them. So also they tend to enhance this vascularization. Then for the third question, they want to to see like the if the vascular are major, the no the vessels are major. So they try to they put another marker with our like more specialized ones like collagen four and LTL brush markers, which are like um, receptor markers for more developed one is the vessels. And in A, in the figure A, they found that uh, that are more organized these um, factors. The LTL brush marker is like just in one zone, so the cells around the um, this is like the the vessel, ah, <laughs> and this is like the vessel uh, here. So the cells in blue need to be very well organized, forming like the lumen. And as you can see in the static, there are like spaces between the cells, and it's not right to have these spaces. And in high flow, we can see like that the bus the vessels is well formed. And then in B, they use another marker, ciliary marker, and markers for solute transporters. In fact, they use that ciliary markers, solute transporters, drug transporters, and adult transcription factors that to see if there, these, these proteins were being expressed. And as we can see in the high flow, uh, in the high flow, all these factors and receptors are being expressed in um, in a, mm, are more being expressed so that they are over expressing and, mm, and that's mm. also they take photographs also with the angio tools imaging technique in 3D to measure of all these vasculature surface area and also they found like that in high flow this vascularization is being promoted the tubules are bigger they are connecting between each other and in g is like the photographs that they take with the with this um, tool of visualization of of the 3d images and they they with these photographs they measure the distance. And also it's important to see that they use a new factor, which is BEGF, a vascular endothelial growth factor. And they try to study like the, um, the function of this factor in the, in the culture. And if they have minus is the inhibitor, minus is the factor. And as we can see, they are not very understood this factor because in the culture, they added more, or more of this factor, and they not um, show enhanced vascularization. They they were thinking that if this factor helps to develop this, when they added more quantity, they see that it doesn't happen. So <laughs> they are like um, a concentration between the between the organoid that if you added more you have the opposite result where you were thinking. So they are not very well understood these factors and G and K are other photographs in different axes of the vessels. Mm -hmm. For for um, for study the the um, question number four, like if the positive positives are cell in the kidney that helps to filter the blood to retain the molecules and this is why this is very important for mentions. Positives are in the in he in blue. This blue are positives, and 
photosynthesis were cells in the in the organoid that need to be vascularized to have like a functional kidney, and they study also how this process are made in these organoids. To see, we can see that MCAM and PCAM are that are factors of vascularization uh, start like invading the polycyte here, and um, that means that it, it is being vascularized. And the glomeruli, that is also the potosy, <laughs> uh, they study how much of the MCAM, PECAM, and they were invaded, and also they found that with a high flow, they enhance these activities, they invade and vascularize the potosy. Mm -hmm. They do it with uh, vascularization of the glomeruli. Take they talk about all the stages of the vascularization. First is this is the first stage, the second and the third, and they take pictures of how this is made in the um, in the organoid sculpture. We can see that all happen in the same way as a control, like the real one organoid the, of the mouse and they found like the same shapes and the same processes, the same transcription factors. And so with this um, way of culture, they um, make this process happen because in the static and conventional one, they never arrive to form these type of vessels. In one moment, they have to put the organoid in vivo with a mouse and they finish to build all these vessels and with this type of culture they uh, make this vascularization without a transplantation in a mouse. Um, then they also study like the food processes which are like the formation of capillarities more speciali specialized vessels more and more specialization and we, they can see that these factors are also being transcripted. They are like these transcription factors in the in the in the in this process in this type of culture. And in M, we can see like also photographs in microscopy of the food processes. And in M is in the um, uh, in the high flow organoids. And in N was in uh, a mouse also at the control to compare if it happens in the same way in vivo and they show us that this happens so they are really good hypothesis they are being have they are having like all the processes of major vessels and well i put the similar in the first so i finish <laughs> thank you nice <laughs> So I have like a question. So well, like two. So basically, is just like um, mechanical and chemical factors, right? That induce like um, vascularization. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> and the second question, just like <laughs> that was just like a problem. <laughs> and like the second question, well, is more like for again application. Uh, I like. Uh, that part of looking forward. So <laughs> it's like, do you think that maybe in the future this technology can be used in order like to make a complete tissue that can be inserted into someone who has like a liver damage or even maybe create a liver like you using like this knowledge? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like to a question like it's like in is not very well developed these techniques because of they are like a lot of factors taken in account in fact they try to as, as you can see we don't understand very well how the beg factor that is a factor of vascularization works and also i they try to use them for like testing drugs effects and for studying pathologies of kidney. So I think is um, this type of uses of a, a complete or organ is far away, but as 
we can see we are making little organoids that are functional and I think it's a great advance but maybe in the future we can understand when we are understanding all these factors we maybe can create an organ, an entire organ. <laughs> but for the moment, it's just for the um, application of drug tests and pathologies, sick, bueno, of sickness and everything like that. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so I have a question about, um, so like in, in vivo, these things happen due to signaling centers or these um, signaling factors are like produced just like that or how do they work? Like what, the factors of vascularization? Oh. And CAM, the CAM? Yes. Uh, well, as in this experiment, they develop um, the kidneys from um, stem cells, from pluripotent cells, not stem cells, well, well yes, but <laughs> <laughs> there are pluripotent cells that we know they develop um, kidney tissue. So uh, they will do these factors at some point because they are necessary for the vascularization of the, of the, um, of the tissue. As you can see in, in the image A of this, of this slide, okay, they, the air is like the, a receptor of the stem cell which were like the very first receptor that we will, will be in the, um, in the pluripotent stem cells and they will have all the factors in CAMP, the CAMP, that are factors of vascularization. But in, I think in vivo is like the same way because um, the, the pluripotent cell will have signals to, to develop of these all these factors, which are factors for vascularization. So, yes, they use the same factors and like the same way, I think. Okay. No more questions. No? <laughs> so, we finish? Yes. Yes. Gracias. Thank you. <laughs>